We do hope that you enjoy hearing this special audiobook presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. Please feel free to share this audiobook with friends and loved ones. The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life by Drunvalo Melchizedek, Volume 1 Chapter 3 The Darker Side of Our Present and Past in 1990 to the world nations met at an earth summit, in Rio de Janeiro to discuss earth's environmental problems. The largest gathering of heads of state in the history of the world was called because of the danger of losing our planet. Most of the world came, but the United States, the largest polluter in the world, didn't even want to participate. It was obvious that the political administration felt that money, jobs and the economy were more important than whether the earth survived. Five months later, on November 18, 1992, a document titled World Scientists Warning to Humanity, was released. More than 1,600 senior scientists from 71 countries, including over half of all living Nobel Prize winners, signed this document. It was the most alarming warning the world has ever received from such a powerful body of researchers. You would think that this document would hold great credibility and that the world would carefully listen. It began, human beings and the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage on the environment and on critical resources. If not checked, Many of our current practices put at serious risk the future that we wish for human society and the plant and animal kingdoms, and may so alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in the manner that we know. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the collision our present course will bring about. The warning document then began to list the crises, polluted water, oceans, soil, atmosphere, diminishing plant and animal species and human overpopulation. More than half of the life on this planet is now extinct and continuing to die. The words became stem, no more than one or a few decades remain before the chance to avert the threats we now confront will be lost and the prospects for humanity immeasurably diminished. We the undersigned, say nigh or members of the world's scientific community hereby warn all humanity of what lies ahead. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. Yet most of the world rejected this statement even though it was created by one of the most respected scientific bodies ever assembled on earth. You would think we would pause and say, if this is true, what can we do? let's drop everything and do whatever is necessary. But the governments know that if we are to avert this crisis, we must change the way we live, and that would not be politically comfortable. No politician wants to be the one to introduce this unpopular change. To the governments, the economy would suffer and perhaps even collapse if we were to stop polluting. So it has become a war of money against life terrible but true. The New York Times and the Washington Post two of our most respected leaders in reporting the news, rejected this document as not newsworthy. This gives you a good idea of the importance we place on the planet itself. You can read about all this and much more in The Sacred Balance, Rediscovering Our Place in Nature by David Suzuki. Think for a moment, this warning document gives us, one or a few more decades, to avert this crisis and it was written seven years ago. This earth is billions of years old. It has taken millions of years for mankind to reach this level of awareness, yet in the mere 10 to 30 years, a geological blink of an eye, if we do not act in a positive manner, we may become, irretrievably mutilated. The word extinct was avoided, but we all know it is a possibility. Update, since June 1996 a new possibility has been given to us. Perhaps we have found a way to heal the earth of her environmental problems. This is the work of the new workshop we call the Earth Sky. As much as I would love to tell you where the work of the flower of life has taken us, this is not the time. A new book will have to be written because this new information is too vast to discuss in a simple update.
All I can say is that I am very optimistic for the 3D survival of Mother Earth at this time. Update, since June 1996 a new possibility has been given to us. Perhaps we have found a way to heal the Earth of her environmental problems. This is the work of the new workshop we call the Earth Sky. As much as I would love to tell you where the work of the Flower of Life has taken us, this is not the time. A new book will have to be written because this new information is too vast to discuss in a simple update. All I can say is that I am very optimistic for the 3D survival of Mother Earth at this time. Update, remember that Professor Einstein did not know for sure that when the first atomic bomb was ignited, the nuclear chain reaction would stop when the original fuel sample was expended. Our government knew that when this first bomb exploded, it might be the end of the world, all life over in a matter of minutes. But we did it anyway. This is spiritual incompetence. We are faced with another moment in history where our government has decided to take another chance with our lives. When HARP was turned on in the spring of 1997, they did not know for sure if the atmosphere was going to be destroyed. They still do not know for sure what the long-range effects will be, just as they did not know during World War II with the Manhattan Project. What is HARP? You need to know. HARP stands for High Frequency Active Oral Research Project. It is a weapon massively more powerful than the atomic bomb. They intend to be more than 1.7 gigawatts, billion watts, of radiated power into the ionosphere and actually boil the upper atmosphere in order to create a mirror and slash or an artificial antenna to transmit huge amounts of power to any specific area on the earth. This energy would be used to manipulate global weather, hurt or destroy ecosystems, knock out electronic communication, and change our moods and mental states. Not to mention that it could be used to try to destroy or manipulate the new Christ grid around the world. Read Angels Don't Play This Harp by Gene Manning and Dr. Nick Bigick. You will learn more. Update, in 1995 and 1996, the secret government exploded six atomic bombs in an area near Mora Island, part of the French Tahitian Islands. France, along with several other countries, placed these bombs into a sacred physical place of Mother Earth's body. If they had done this to your mum, you would have called it violent rape. They were neutron bombs, which do not destroy structures, but merely destroy all life in the region. If the Earth were a woman, the area where they deliberately placed the bomb would be her perineum. Going straight through the Earth from there would be Earth's crown chakra, which just happens to be the Great Pyramid region in Egypt. This became the focus of attention, for the secret government shut down the entire Great Pyramid, not allowing anyone to come near for three days so they could test the results in the consciousness of the planet. They were trying to destroy a specific field of energy that has grown to enclose the Earth. You could call it one of Earth's memory banks. You and I call it Christ consciousness. They, the secret government, which is still you and me, were fearful of this new consciousness, but I believe now it has been mostly resolved. The polarities of the earth are slowly merging. At the time of this transcript in 1993 we were living in a period of planetary insight. Now, in 1997, we are on the edge of planetary unity based on understanding. The great test is still ahead especially if the secret government decides to use HARP to try to destroy the Christ grid. Update, on the positive side, doctors at UCLA began about five years ago examining a young boy who had been born with AIDS. He had been checked at birth, at six months and again at one year. He still had AIDS. He wasn't checked again until he was about five. When they checked him this time, all traces of the AIDS virus were gone. It was as though he had never contracted AIDS. They didn't know how his system became immune, all they knew was that it did. They checked everything they could think of, including his D-N-A. It was here where they found a change. This young boy did not have human DNA. We have 64 codons in our DNA, but in normal humans only 20 of these codons are turned on. 
the rest are inert or not working, except for three, which are the stop and start programs. This young boy had 24 codons turned on. He had found a way to mutate that made him immune to AIDS. In fact, when they were testing him, they found that he was immune to everything. They found that his immune system was 3,000 times stronger than a normal human's. Then they found another child with the same situation, coming out of AIDS and turning on the same 24 codons, becoming immune to AIDS and other diseases. They found 100, then 10,000. UCLA now believes that 1% of the world has made this change. They now believe that 55 million children and adults are no longer human, by DNA definition. There are so many people doing this now that science believes that a new human race is being born at this time and that it seems to have come out of AIDS. It is almost impossible for these people to become sick. It is also interesting that in November 1998, it was announced that in 1997, AIDS dropped off by 47%, which is the biggest drop in history for any major disease. Could this be one of the reasons? Further, in cracking the Bible code by Jeffrey Satinova, when they ran the word AIDS into the code, they found all the usual associated words. They saw the words in the blood, death, annihilation, in the form of a virus, the immunity, the HIV, destroyed, and many more. However, there were certain other words that did not make sense to those researchers but that only now can be understood in the light of the previous information. They found the words, the end to all diseases. This is perhaps the single most important event in the world today. Update, on May 23, 1998, Aaron Duval, president of the Egyptology Society in Miami, Florida, announced that ancient Atlantis has been found near by Menai, and that it can be scientifically proven beyond any doubt. They have found a huge underwater pyramid and have open hermetically sealed chambers to expose records that confirm what Plato said about Atlantis during the time of ancient Greece. Mr. Duval said they will present their evidence to the world before the end of 1998 or soon afterward. We are about to enter negative subjects for a bit. You could say, there he goes getting into that fear stuff just after he said not to get into fear, but I want us to observe all the facets, both positive and negative, of life here on planet earth. I don't want to look at only the positive ones, I want you to see the whole picture. And when you look at the whole picture, both the good and the bad, you'll see that the chaos is just part of the truth and part of the birth. A phenomenal change in human consciousness is occurring at this moment, though if you take any tiny segment of what's happening or look out in the world and see all the wars, famines and human emotional garbage that's filling our newspapers, the future does not look good. But when you get the whole image of life, you'll see that beyond all the negative, there's something much greater and vast and sacred and holy occurring at this moment in history. It becomes clear. Life is whole, complete and perfect now. Our endangered earth however, the most conservative scientists in the world that I can find don't give our planet more than 50 years, 50. The most conservative scientists on the planet say there will be no life or almost none on this planet within 50 years if we continue the way we're going. Many scientists give us only 3 or more years, some of them give us 10 most don't give us more than 15 years. It depends on who you read. Even if it were a hundred or a thousand years, would that be acceptable? You would not be hearing any of this information today if it were not for some changes in our government that have taken place in the last eight years that have allowed this information to be presented. Although they're not allowing you to know everything, there has been a change in the powers that be where they're beginning to cooperate with life. They simply can't let you know the full extent of the situation, because they believe that most of the world would just quit their jobs and say, the heck with everything, leading to complete chaos. Instead of quitting, is not this the time to focus? Human consciousness is powerful. We will know what to do. We are more than the ordinary world knows. Do you remember? Okay, now let's talk about the dark side. 
This is a January 2, 1989, issue of Time magazine. In 1988 the secret government of the world decided to allow us to know some of what was going on around environmental problems. This was the first major publication on the subject in the world. Time magazine declared the Earth to be the planet of the year. Instead of featuring a man or woman of the year, they broke away from their tradition. The entire magazine was devoted to our endangered Earth and its problems. If you were to read the problems as they were presented in 1989 and then read the problems as they are being presented in articles today, you'll realize that what they gave us in 1989 was a ultra-watered-down version of the truth. It wasn't even close. But at least it was a beginning for our world to see the truth about what we have done to Mother Earth. We're going to discuss only four or five different problems the Earth has, though there are multiple different scenarios going on. If any one of these scenarios were to break down, all life on the planet would eventually die. And at the moment they're all about to break down, it's just a matter of which one breaks down first. And whenever one system goes, then all the rest of them will go eventually, and that's it, there won't be any more human life. It will be over with, and we'll end up just like Mars or the dinosaurs. A few years ago, around the turn of this century, there were 30 million species of life forms on Earth, 30 million different species of life. In 1993 there were about 15 million. It took billions of years to create these life forms, and in less than a blink of an eye, a mere hundred years, half of the life on this dear earth is dead. Around 30 species a minute are now becoming extinct somewhere. If you were to watch this planet from space, it would appear to be dying very, very rapidly. Yet we're going on as though nothing's happening and everything's great. We're sticking money in the bank and driving our cars and just wiggling right on. Yet from an honest point of view, we have a real life and death problem going on here on earth, and few people seem to be really serious about it. When they tried to get the entire world to come together in Rio in the early 90s to discuss the worldwide environmental problem, our president didn't even want to go. Why not? Because the problems are so serious that if we were to fix them, another problem would happen that would be an even more serious problem. From the president's point of view, we would be plunged into a worldwide financial breakdown, after which a large portion of the Earth's population would die from starvation and other problems. In essence, we cannot afford to repair the environment. On the other side of the coin, can we afford not to? Dying oceans. It was in the August 1, 1988 issue that Time magazine focused its attention on the oceans and what was happening there. Jacques Cousteau wrote a book about this around 1978. He was a very respected person, but when he wrote this book, he lost credibility in scientific circles because he made a statement that nobody could believe. He founded his statements on pure science, but people simply could not or would not accept the truth. Specifically, he said that the Mediterranean Sea would be a dead body of water by the end of 1990 and that the Atlantic Ocean would also be dead by the turn of the century. People thought, this guy's nuts. It's never going to happen. Well, it is happening. The Mediterranean Sea is now somewhere around 95% dead. It's not 100%, so he was not exactly right. Nevertheless, it's still going to be a dead sea if people continue to live the way they do. And the Atlantic Ocean is rapidly doing the same. Maybe it won't happen in the year 2000, but it will happen very soon after that. Unless something changes dramatically, it will die, no fish, no dolphins, no life in the Atlantic. We can't live without the oceans. The bottom of the food chain, the plankton, will be gone, and if they go, we go. When we don't take this seriously, it's like saying, well, I don't really need my heart. This is a major component in the ecosystem on earth, and it's going fast. This is not debatable, this is scientific fact. The only part that is debatable is when. It is really happening. 
Nobody believed it would happen because they just couldn't accept this truth. New York City, for instance, has pipes that go 20 miles out and dump all their human feces into the oceans. They figured, well, the oceans will take care of it. But for the last 60 years or so it's been building up into a huge mountain. Now, there's a mountain range of shit out in the ocean that is moving toward New York City. It's now up against and actually coming into the harbor, and they don't know what to do about it. It would take more money than New York has to fix it. This is the kind of foresight that we as humans have demonstrated. The human manure approaching New York is an Atlantic Ocean problem. However, the problem is not limited to the Atlantic or the Mediterranean. The Pacific Ocean is Earth's largest body of water, and it will probably take longer, but it is also having tremendous problems, especially in certain areas. The red tide is the first deadly sign of the pollution. It's an algae that destroys everything that leaves underneath it, it kills everything. And these red tides are beginning to sweep all over, especially around Japan where there's so much pollution. We've made lots of mistakes all over the earth because we don't have the consciousness to know how to live in harmony with our own body, Mother Earth. This is like a symptom of cancer or some other dreaded disease. Ozone. Here's another problem. Figure 3 to 4 shows the ozone hole above the South Pole. Ozone forms a thin layer about 6 feet thick. It's a really thin, fragile layer a living layer that's constantly being rebuilt. We know very little about it, though we know more than we would if it weren't for the UVC light, ultraviolet light, band C, that's coming through the holes right now. When they began to detect huge amounts of UVC, especially as shown here coming into the South Pole, they couldn't understand how there got to be so much, because their computers didn't show it. Then they found out that their software programming was set up in such a way as to override this sort of thing. After they reprogrammed their software, they found out the hole was really there. This was some years ago. What they actually were looking for was chlorine monoxide, the molecule shown in the far right of figure 3 to 5. They figured that the ozone hole is caused by various chemicals, one of which are CFCs. CFCs react with the ozone in such a way that when the chlorine connects with the ozone, the ozone molecule breaks apart, thus forming oxygen and chlorine monoxide. Scientists figured, given the speed they thought the CFCs were moving toward the ozone, that the chlorine monoxide up there would be about 30 times over normal, and they were very worried about it. So the world governments tried to get the companies that were producing the CFCs freon and various other chemicals that cause this problem, to stop producing those products and find other answers. In reply, the companies all said in unison, we're not doing it. That's a natural phenomenon. We have nothing to do with it. So the world governments had to prove in court that the companies were at fault, which they did. To get the proof they needed. For the first time in the history of the earth every single country on the planet cooperated in a single venture. This had never happened before. They flew high altitude planes over the South Pole for about two years collecting data, and they finally came up with something that really scared them. The destructive ingredient, chlorine monoxide, wasn't 30 times over normal, it was 500 times over normal and moving much faster than they had believed. This article came out in 1992. I believe. It first says that the EPA predicts 200,000 more skin cancer deaths from the ozone hole. But up in the right column they have a tiny section reporting that the EPA says that the fatality estimates they had originally given were incorrect, and are 21 times worse than they had estimated. 21 times, now, that's a lot. It's not like saying, well, it's a little bit more. This is what the government has been doing, they give out little bits of information in little articles that don't tell you much. They don't make it a big deal. By law they have to announce it, so they announce it in little articles and then let it go. Then they up the ante in another insignificant article, as in this article here, for example, where they said the danger was 21 times higher than their first estimate.
Then two weeks later the same paper comes back and says, oh, by the way, we were off two weeks ago, it's actually double that. Well, double doesn't sound like much, except that means it went from 21 times to 42 times worse than their first report, which is an incredible amount. If the truth had been told in the first place, it would have sounded terrible and created fear. This is what's been going on all over the world for a long time. The only way the world governments know how to deal with the situation is by letting it out little by little, admitting to more and more and more. They know they have to tell you the truth, for reasons you'll learn later, but they're afraid to say we're in real trouble. They just say, well, it's not so bad, but it's getting worse, and statements like this. Well, not only is there an ozone hole at the South Pole, but there's one at the North Pole now, and the rest of the ozone is Swiss cheese. In 1991 or 1992, there was a major television production on the ozone hole. It brought together all the major people who were involved in studying this, and they discussed all the pros and cons. They interviewed a particular husband and wife team, I don't have their names, but they also wrote a book on this very subject several years ago, predicting that the ozone hole was going to happen. Before we even knew about it, they had studied it all, according to this program. And the ozone is now undergoing changes exactly like they said it would end up exactly the rate they predicted. This couple was brought on TV as the experts, and the interviewer asked, well, what do you think? This interviewer was kind of puppy-like, asking, what are we going to do? You guys know everything about it, so what are we going to do about the ozone? The husband said, there's nothing we can do. I don't believe they like to hear statements like that on major channels. The interviewer asked, what do you mean, there's nothing we can do? The author said, well, suppose we get the entire world to cooperate. Which is the first thing that would have to happen, and we can't even do that now, some 15 years later. Suppose we do get the entire planet to say, okay, we'll stop it all today. No more of these chemicals that are destroying the ozone will ever be used again. The author said, okay, suppose we did it. Suppose we got the whole world to stop. That still doesn't solve the problem. And the interviewer said, what do you mean? Wouldn't it just heal itself? The author answered, no, because the spray can that you sprayed yesterday sits on the surface of the ground and the CFCs take 15 to 20 years to rise to the ozone layer. This layer that's slowly rising and eating the ozone will continue for 15 to 20 years even if we stop everything today. And it will continue to eat it faster and faster, because we've used more and more of these chemicals in recent years. He said, there won't even be a ozone layer, I think he said in 10 years. I see no solution at all. If we lose our ozone, we're in big trouble. All the animals of the world will go blind. You won't be able to go out during daytime without a space suit on, meaning every square inch of your body will have to be covered special UVC goggles and everything. In a short time the UVC light would eventually kill you and we are rapidly approaching that. If you don't think so, read at what the Wall Street Journal reported in January 1993. The journal was reporting what's happening in southern Chile, which is close to the ozone hole at the South Pole. The animals are starting to go blind. The people who live there have thick, dark skin, and they've spent all their lives outside, but now they're getting burned in the course of everyday living and it's spreading north from Chile and starting to happen everywhere. Because of the Swiss cheese aspect of the entire ozone layer, places all over the earth are becoming unsafe. You never know where these spots are going to be because they move over the face of the earth from year to year. This ozone problem is happening now, not tomorrow or later or maybe someday. It's occurring at this very minute. Given another few years, we're going to be in really serious trouble. They knew about the ozone problem at least as far back as when Reagan was president. When the environmental agencies asked him, what will we do about this ozone problem? 
Reagan was really flippant about it. He said something like, or, we'll just issue raincoats and dark sunglasses to solve the problem. Just like that, what the heck? We're talking about our very lives here, our very existence, and the governments are continuing as though it doesn't even matter. The Greenhouse Ice Age. In the first seven days in office, President Bush was approached by 700 environmental groups, 700 of them in unity and agreement. They said to Bush, we have an even bigger problem than the ozone and the oceans, the biggest problem that we know of is the greenhouse effect. If the greenhouse effect is not checked very soon, it's going to destroy the planet. This is what they had agreed on and what they believed was the truth. For a while Gorbachev and the world's governments were talking about how they were going to put space stations up there to monitor the environment and move with responsible action. Gorbachev was gung-ho on the whole thing. Then I guess they gave up on it, just quit, though they're still watching these things very carefully. It's a pretty hopeless situation. Figure 3 to 7 is a satellite photograph of the oceans taken from above Australia. That dark blotch above Australia and New Guinea reached the hottest ocean eye temperature in recorded history in 1992. It was 86 degrees Fahrenheit in that spot. That's 86 degree ocean water. If that continues to spread across the equator, it's going to do exactly what John Hamaker has predicted. If you're familiar with Hamaker and his theories, he has powerful evidence that as this water heats up, something very different from a hot planet will happen, it's going to be a cold one, very, very cold. Dr. Hamaker predicts an ice age descending upon us within a few short years. I won't go fully into the dynamics of the so-called greenhouse effect, but an intimate part of it is tied to rocks, minerals and trees. One average acre of trees holds within it 50,000 tons of carbon dioxide. When trees are cut down, burned or just die, all that carbon dioxide gets released into the atmosphere, and when the atmosphere contains a certain level of carbon dioxide, it activates the beginning of an ice age. Hamaker found proof that this is what triggered the last few ice ages on this planet. He found his evidence primarily from studying core samples taken from ancient lake beds. The core samples show, by simply looking at the pollen count, that the Earth for millions of years had a cycle of 90,000 years of ice followed by a temperate period of 10,000 years, followed by 90,000 years of ice, followed by 10,000 temperate years. That particular cycle has been going on for a long, long time. In addition, Hamaker has discovered, and other people have verified it, that the length of time it takes to go from a warm age into an ice age is a mere 20 years. People who have been studying this for a long time believe that we are possibly now around 16 or 17 years into that 20 year cycle, but of course no one really knows. And they say that when the end of the 20 years or so is reached, snaps fingers, in a single day, less than 24 hours, it'll all be over. The clouds will back up over the earth, the average temperature will drop to about 50 below zero, and most areas of the world won't see the sun again for 90,000 years. If those guys are right, we've got only a few more years of sunshine. It'll keep getting warmer and warmer and hotter and hotter until the day hits, then snap it'll be all over. I'm not going to give all the details of Hamaker's work, but I suggest you do the research yourself if you want to know about it. He has powerful evidence. Study what he has to say. His book is called The Survival of Civilization. Ice Age to Warmth, A Quick Switch. Scientists have just discovered another surprise, which has some of them shocked and barely able to believe it. They thought that when an ice age recedes, it would take thousands of years to warm back up again. But they now have evidence that it takes only three days, says an article written in Time magazine. It takes 20 years to go from warm to cold and three days to go from cold to warm. So the greenhouse effect is a major and serious problem. No one knows the answer. But what's scary is that they're trying to instigate supposed answers that are totally untested. They're all fighting about whose answer is the best and who wants to do what, 
but nobody knows. It's like the ozone, they've got maybe 15 different ideas about what to do to fix the ozone, and any one of them might make it better, or worse. No one knows what these things are going to do, because we have never done them before. We seem to be willing to experiment on ourselves to find out if we're going to make it or not. Underground atomic bombs and CFCs. On top of that, all kinds of other problems are occurring. Some things are so scary that governments are afraid to tell you anything at all. They won't tell you about one thing that I simply have to talk about, because it's so important that somebody has to say something. I know they don't want me to talk about this, but I don't think they'll stop me. We're finding CFCs in the upper atmosphere. Now, Authorities in the government have been saying that CFC products like Freon will float up though because they're lighter than air. But guess what, and you scientist types can check this out, CFCs are not lighter than air, they're four times heavier than air. They sink, they don't rise. So how did they get up there? It might have been the 212 above ground atomic bombs that our governments have blown off in the world. Many people suspect that's how all those CFCs got up there in the first place, and that it really wasn't us who caused most of the problem with our air conditioners. It was the atomic government so slash the world. At one point they all went underground with their bombs, and we thought, that's okay, they're bombing underground, nothing will happen now. It's not okay, folks. It's probably the most dangerous thing that's going on in the world today, even more than ha, and they're still doing it. I cannot prove what I am about to say, so do not believe it until you can prove it. Adam Trombley, a famous scientist who has accomplished important work in science, has been monitoring the underground atomic bombing around the world. He probably knows more about this than any other person in the world, even the governments recognize this. Trombley explains what happens when these atomic bombs are exploded underground. The energy doesn't just sit there, it has to go somewhere, so it goes shooting through the earth, bouncing off its insides, ripping apart the plates and doing incredible damage as it goes bouncing around like a ping pong ball. This bouncing effect inside the earth continues for about 30 days after the one explosion. Trombley, much like Jacques Cousteau and others, now has a theory that predicts all kinds of things that will happen, and they're all happening um. Things like the Indian Ocean dropping 23 feet over a very short period of time was predicted by Trombley at least 10 years ago, just as Jacques Cousteau had predicted the death of the Mediterranean Sea in 10 years. Many brilliant people are speaking out their truth, but few people are listening. If Trombley is correct, we're only a few more atomic bombs away from the whole planet literally splitting apart in little pieces. The governments around the world have been on red alert since about 1991 over the changes happening to the earth that were predicted by Trombley. They're scared to death. Yet I believe China just blew up another one, and the US is talking about blowing one up just because China did. Anyway, life goes on. It's a good thing there are other levels to our spirit than just the physical. If it weren't for the ascended masters and our higher aspect, we would be in a hopeless situation. But because of the work of other great souls, you and humanity are just beginning to live. You will soon be birthed into another new, clean and beautiful world, thank God, and there's no one else to thank but God. We're going to be okay through all of this. And yet I will continue. The Streaker Memorandum on AIDS. Here's one last drama. Actually, there are many other perilous situations, I could go on for hours, but I'll just give you this last one about AIDS. I suggest you try to find the Streaker Memorandum material if you haven't read it or watched the video. The governments are really trying to suppress it. Dr. Streaker made a video memorandum of what he believed happened around AIDS. He is a brilliant person. He has worked with retroviruses and is an expert on this subject. He showed the video on television, and the governments threatened him. They allegedly killed his brother and the senator who was sponsoring it. But they didn't get Strecker, 
that would have been too obvious, I guess. Dr. Strecker has distributed many of his videos. He got them out to the world, though you don't hear about it anymore. Dr. Strecker shows on his film how the United Nations was trying to solve an environmental problem. They knew that the biggest environmental problem in the entire world was the human population, and at the rate it was going, the world would double its population by 2010 or 2012. But because of what the Chinese did, allowing only one child per couple, and other strenuous work around the world, they slowed it down but they believe that it's still going to happen. It is now estimated that somewhere around 2014 the world population will have doubled. If that happens, computer models have shown that all life on Earth will die or wish they were dead, according to the United Nations, because we can barely keep it together with almost 6 billion people. Can you imagine what it would be like with 11 to 12 billion people in the world? There's just no way at least under the present system. So, if you were in the United Nations and knew this potential disaster was going to take place and had to make a decision, what would you do? I'm not judging the people who did this, just put yourself in their position of great power. You see that the earth is coming to a solid wall, that it's going to be totally destroyed if something is not changed. So they made a decision and Dr. Strecker showed the memorandum right on television. The United Nations decided that, rather than hit that wall of 11 billion people, right then and there they were going to create a virus or a disease that would kill specifically three quarters of the people on earth. In other words, instead of increasing to 11 billion, they wanted to reduce the current population by three quarters. He showed the AC population by three quarters. He showed the actual UN document that planned to eliminate three quarters of the world's population. Dr. Strecker showed scientifically exactly how the UN did it. They took a virus from a sheep and a virus from a cow and blended them together in a certain way to make the AIDS virus. But before they ever distributed it, they also made a cure for it. The governments have the cure right now, according to Dr. Strecker. The people who were doing this and history will verify this, were obviously prejudiced, because they singled out two groups, the blacks and the homosexuals. In Haiti there was an epidemic of hepatitis B moving through the homosexual community, and they all needed to be injected with the hepatitis B vaccine. So UN agents took the AIDS virus, put it in the hepatitis B vaccine and injected it into everyone. That's how the virus started according to Dr. Strecker. The other evidence that this is true is that throughout the rest of the world, the virus was not given exclusively to homosexuals. In Africa, where at least 75 million people have AIDS, the ratio of male to female infection is almost exactly 50 to 50, from the beginning until now. Only in Haiti, and eventually in the United States did it spread almost exclusively through the homosexual population. If you look at the figures for this country, females are now getting AIDS faster than anyone else. Soon nature will balance it out, and you'll see exactly the same thing you see everywhere else around the world, which is that equal numbers of males and females have AIDS. It isn't a gay disease at all, it has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the prejudice of the people who created it. According to Dr. Strecker, the World Health Organization, which has been instrumental in creating this disease, has also been concerned about other diseases, and so have doctors pretty much everywhere. For instance, let's take cancer, doctors have been concerned that someday cancer will become contagious, not by pollution or foods or things like this, but that it will become airborne or waterborne, like a cold you'd just walk by somebody with cancer and you'd get it. But the number of different kinds of cancer viruses is so small that the likelihood of that ever happening is pretty slim. It still could happen, but it's not likely. But for AIDS, there are 9000 to the 4th power or 6561 trillion totally different kinds of AIDS viruses, that's a huge number. And every time someone gets AIDS, a brand new virus is created, one that has never been seen before, ever. 
this means that it's inevitable, mathematically speaking, it's just a matter of time, that AIDS will spread rapidly, just like a cold, throughout the world. There is a story going around that the World Health Organization believes that this rapidly spreading form of AIDS may have already begun. Around 1990 or 1991 the WHO, checked an African tribe of 1,400 members, including everyone from little babies to old people, who obviously had all different kinds of sexual practices, you know, little babies aren't into sexual things, and they found that every single member, without exception, had AIDS. That's when the WHO announced secretly that the virus was probably now airborne or waterborne, and that it might eventually spread like wildfire, like a common cold. There would be a few years lag as with any other new disease. If this were to happen, would you know that you are safe? You need to know the truth, you are more than you know. A perspective on earthly problems if we were not multidimensional beings, if we were only physical bodies connected to the earth and had nowhere to go, we would be in a very serious situation. But because of who we are, what is about to happen on earth could become a vehicle for enormous growth. Remember, life is a school. Maya is, Maya. But still, if we realize the incredibly dangerous situation we're in, we might awaken to who we are. The only reason I'm even saying these words and not keeping it secret is because we're like a group of people in a sinking boat. It's got a big hole in it and the water's pouring in. It's not time to sit there and play games and do business as usual and think along the normal ways of thinking. If you didn't know the truth about our environment, you might just go along with your life and not act. I'm not suggesting to act environmentally, though that is not wrong, what I'm much more concerned with is an internal form of acting, a meditation, a meditation that consciously reconnects you to all life everywhere, it is what the Taoists say, the way to do is to be. There's nothing wrong with acting externally, but there's another kind of acting that's required here, I believe. It requires a state of mind where we realize the situation we begin to take it seriously and work in a way where we can make some real changes in our consciousness. This inner thing we need to focus on and understand will slowly unfold as we continue. Whoever understands the other side of this coin of life will realize that these environmental issues are not a real problem when higher consciousness enters into the 3D world, though from a 3D point of view, it does look like the end of life. The History of the World we're going to open a new subject, the history of the world and how it relates to the present. Each one of these pieces of the puzzle widens the view. The situation in which we find ourselves in this world didn't develop at random. Events occur that we need to remember. Many of us were here in past lives, and we have these memories within us. But that's besides the point. We need to know exactly what occurred in order to understand how it developed into this situation today. This history, of course, will not be found in history books, because history books of human civilization go back only 6,000 years, and we need to go back about 450,000 years to begin. This information was first given to me by Thoth around 1985. Then after Thoth left in 1991. I became aware of Zechariah Sitchin, read his works, and found out that Sitchin's and Thoth's information were almost perfect fits, so perfect it just couldn't be a coincidence. It was amazing how close they were. Many things that Thoth had mentioned, such as giants in Atlantis, which he didn't explain further were explained in Sitchin's books. And many things that Sitchin appears to have overlooked were deeply explained by Thoth, so the combination of these two sources gives a very interesting viewpoint. You don't have to accept this viewpoint, you can just listen to it like a legend, think about it and see if it's workable for you. If something doesn't feel true to you, then of course don't accept it. But I believe this is as close as I can get to the truth, and I offer it to you. Remember, I had to translate the geometrical and hieroglyphic images of Thoth into English. Something is bound to get lost, but I do feel it is close enough to trigger your memories. First you must realize something about written history. 
somebody has to hold the pen and write it down, so written history is always the viewpoint of the person or people who wrote it. Written history began only in the last 6,000 years, but would that history be the same if it had been written by different people? Consider that in most cases it was the winners of the wars who wrote the history books. Whoever won a war said, this is what happened. The losers didn't get to put in their two cents. Look at any of the major wars, especially World War II, which was a very emotional war. If Hitler had won World War II, our history books would be completely different. We'd be examining a totally different set of facts. We would be the bad guys, and they would have shown good reason for doing in the Jews etc. But we won, so we wrote it from our perspective. Well, everything's like that all the way through history. Nobody ever talks about this subject, yet it's obvious. Even Thoth was very aware of this, he said, I'm giving you my viewpoint. I have watched the centuries go by, but I'm only one person. This is what I believe is true, but you must realize that other people may hold different viewpoints on history. So even he was not saying, this is it, take it or leave it. So with that observation, we'll proceed. Sitchin in Sumeria. I'm going to begin first with Zechariah Sitchin's work. If you haven't read his books yet, you have a great treat in store if you want to read about this first hand. His primary book is called The Twelfth Planet, though I recommend to others, The Lost Realms and Genesis Revisited, in that order. He writes about many cities that were described in the Christian Bible, such as Babylon, Akkad and Irch, which for a long time people thought were myths because nobody could prove their existence. There wasn't even the slightest sign that they existed. Then they finally found one city, which led to another, which led to another, which led to another. They eventually found all of the cities mentioned in the Bible. Realize that all these ancient cities have been discovered in the last 120 years or so, most of them more or less recently. As they've dug down into the layers of these ancient cities, they've pulled out thousands of cylindrical clay tablets upon which the history of Sumer and the history of the earth is recorded in great detail, going back hundreds of thousands of years. Their written language is called cuneiform. What I'll be telling you is not just Sitchin's interpretation. Many other scholars now know how to read cuneiform, and as they translate these works, it's changing our whole viewpoint of the world, of what we think is true, just as John Anthony West's work with the Sphinx is also influencing modern thinking about human history. We'll come back around full circle later to explain how the Sumerians received their information. The Sumerian records are the oldest written records on the planet, 5,800 years old, but they describe things that happened billions of years ago and in great detail things that happened after 450,000 years ago. Whether you're using scientific knowledge or thoths, our race is about 200,000 years old. Sitchin says that we're older than that, maybe 300,000 years or so, but the records and thoth do not say that, and neither do the Melchiz edicts. We've been here slightly more than 200,000 years, but there were civilizations on the earth, long before this cycle and long before the Nephilim, that were far more advanced than the Nephilim or anything we've seen since. They left without a trace. By the end of this book you'll understand why there was nothing left when they departed. This is the planet's past. It's part of who we are, in a way. We have access to all that information. There's a component within each one of us that has all this information recorded. It's easily accessible, but most of us are just not aware of it. Normally we give greatest credence to the oldest source of an historical event because it is closer in time than a scribe further removed from the event. These are the oldest writings we have, with the possible exception of the geometrical language that predates Egyptian hieroglyphics. The ancient Sumerians were telling us a story of history that's very difficult to accept because of our certainty that what we now know about the past is correct. The story is so outrageous on so many levels that scientists are having a very difficult time accepting it even though they know it must be true. 
it is the oldest source. If it weren't so outrageous, we would have accepted it at face value long ago because it came from such an ancient source. On the other hand, if they were crazy, making up stories without any real knowledge, how do we explain that they knew so many facts about nature that, from our point of view of history, would have been impossible for them to know? For example, not only did the Dogons know about all the outer planets, but so did the Sumerians, from the very beginning of their culture. The oldest known culture in the world, the Sumerians, extending back to around 3800 BC, knew exactly what it looked like to approach our solar system from outer space. They knew about all the outer planets, and counted them from outer to inner, as though coming in from outside the solar system. Just as the Dogons showed on the cave wall, the Sumerians described the relative sizes of different planets and described them in detail, as if they were actually passing them in space, what they looked like, the water on them, the color of the clouds. The whole experience was described in detail 3800 years BC. This is fact. How is this possible? Or is the truth of our beginning unknown to us? Before NASA sent our space probe into outer space past the outer planets, Sitchin sent them a Sumerian description of all the planets viewed from space. And when the satellite reached them one by one, sure enough, the Sumerian descriptions were exactly right. Another example. They knew of the precession of the equinoxes from the very beginning of their existence as a culture. They knew that the Earth was tilted on its axis at 23 degrees to its orbital plane around the Sun and that it rotated in a circle that took approximately 25,920 years to complete. Now, that's a tough one for a straight historian to understand, especially a scientific type who knows that it takes 2,160 years of continuous observation of the night skies to even know that the Earth wobbles. The minimum length of time is 2160 years, yet the Sumerians knew about it on day one of their civilization. How did they know it? There is so much extraordinary evidence coming out of these clay tablets that it's not being absorbed into the general thinking very quickly. As I was taught in school and understood it, Moses wrote Genesis around 1250 BC which is about 3,250 years ago. That's what I've always read. Yet Sumerian tablets exist that were written at least 2,000 years before Moses lived, and they have the same account as the first chapter of the Bible almost word for word. These tablets even have Adam and Eve and the names of all their sons and daughters, the whole spectrum of events described in Genesis. It was all written down before Moses ever received it. This proves that Moses was not the author of Genesis. Obviously, this truth will be hard to accept by the Christian community, but it is true. I can understand why this knowledge is taking so long to sink into our modern culture, because it's a huge deviation from the accepted history of the earth, and this minor slash major truth about Moses is only a tiny part of the whole truth. Tiamatans Nibiru even deeper than any of these exceptional and impossible bits of information they knew, and there is much more, is the actual story the Sumerians wrote about the beginnings of the human race before Adam and Eve. They're talking about a time that goes way, way, way back. The story begins several billion years ago when Earth was very young. It was then a large planet called Tiamat, and it rotated around the sun between Mars and Jupiter. Ancient Earth had a large moon, which their records say was destined to become a planet itself someday in the future. According to the records, there was one more planet in our solar system that we are only vaguely aware of in these modern times. The Babylonians called this planet Marduk, and this name has sort of stuck, but the Sumerian name for it was Nibiru. It was a huge planet that spun retrograde compared to the other planets. The other planets are in a more or less flat plane moving in one direction, but Nibiru moves in the other direction, and when it comes close to the other planets, it passes through the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. 
They said that it passes through our solar system every 3,600 years, and when it came, it was usually a big event in our solar system. Then it would go way out past the outer planets and disappear from our sight. NASA, by the way, has probably found this planet. At least it is the most probable possibility. They used two satellites and located it at an enormous distance from the sun. It's definitely there, but the Sumerians knew about it thousands of years ago. Then, according to the records, as fate would have it, on one orbital pass Nibiru came in so close that one of its moons struck Diamat, our Earth, and tore about half of it off, just tripped this planet right in half. According to the Sumerian records, this big chunk of Tiamat, along with her major moon, got knocked off course, went into orbit between Venus and Mars, and became Earth as we now know it. The other chunk broke into a million pieces and became what the Sumerian records call the hammered bracelet, which we call the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This is another point astronomers have marveled at. How did they know about the asteroid belt? because you can't see it with the naked eye. This is how far back the Sumerian records go. The records continue to talk about earlier events, until at one point they tell more about Nibiru. It was inhabited by conscious beings called the Nephilim. The Nephilim are very tall, the females are about 10 to 12 feet and the males are about 14 to 16 feet. They're not immortal but their lifetime is about 360,000 earth years, according to the Sumerian records. Then they die. Nibiru's Atmosphere Problem According to the Sumerian records, approximately 430,000, perhaps as much as 450,000, years ago the Nephilim started having a problem with their planet. It was an atmospheric problem very much like the ozone problem we're having right now. And their scientists decided on a solution similar to what our scientists have considered. Our scientists have considered putting dust particles into the ozone layer to filter out the sun's damaging rays. Nibiru's orbit takes it so far away from the sun that they needed to hold in the heat, so they decided to put gold particles into their higher atmosphere, which would reflect the light and temperature back like a mirror. They planned to get large quantities of gold pulverize it and suspend it in space above their planet. Yes, it is true that they talked about subjects that seem contemporary, ancient humans talking about ETs and sophisticated science. This is not Star Trek or science fiction, it is real. What they said is pretty amazing, and that's why it's been so slow coming out into the general public's knowledge. The Nephilim had the capability of space travel. Though they weren't at that time much further advanced than we are right now, it appears. The Sumerian records show them in their spaceships with flames coming out the back, rocket ships. This is beginning space travel, not sophisticated. In fact, they were so primitive that they had to wait until Nibiru got near enough to Earth before they could even make the trip between the two planets. They couldn't just take off any old time but had to wait until they were close. I believe that since the Nephilim weren't able to leave the solar system, they searched through all the planets that were here and found that Earth had large quantities of gold. So they sent a team here over 400,000 years ago for one purpose only, to mine gold. The Nephilim who came to Earth were headed by 12 members who were like bosses, about 600 workers who were to actually dig the gold and about 300 who stayed in orbit in their mothership. They first went into the area of present-day Iraq and began to establish themselves and build their cities, but that's not where they mined the gold. For the gold, they went to a specific valley in southeast Africa. One of the twelve, whose name was Enlil, was the leader of the miners. They went deep into the earth and dug large quantities of gold. Then every 3,600 years, when Nibiru slash Marduk came around, they would shuttle the gold to their home planet. Then they'd continue their digging while Nibiru traveled its orbit again. According to the Sumerian records, they dug for a very long time, 
about 100,000 to 150,000 years, and then the Nephilim rebellion took place. I don't quite agree with Sitchin's dating on when this happened. He got it, not directly through the Sumerian records, but by calculating how long he thought it should be. He came up with the time of about 300,000 years ago when the rebellion took place. I believe it was closer to 200,000 years ago. The Nephilim rebellion and the origin of our race. Somewhere between 300,000 and 200,000 years ago the Nephilim workers rebelled. The Sumerian records wrote about this rebellion in great detail. The workers rebelled against their bosses, they did not want to keep digging in the mines. You can imagine the workers saying, we've been digging this gold for 150,000 years, and we're tired of it. We're not going to do this anymore. I would probably have lasted about one month. The rebellion presented a problem for the bosses, so the twelve leaders came together to decide what to do. They decided to take a certain life form that already existed on this planet, which was, as I understand it, one of the primates. Then they would take the blood of the primates, mix it with clay, then take the sperm of one of the young male Nephilim and mix these elements together. The tablet actually shows them with what looks like chemical flasks, pouring something from one flask to another to create this new life form. Their plan was to use the DNA of the primates and their own DNA to create a more advanced race than Earth had at that time so that the Nephilim could control this new race for the sole purpose of mining gold. According to the original Sumerian records, we were created to be miners, as slaves to mine gold. That was our only purpose. And when they mined all the gold they needed to save their own planet, their intention was to destroy our race and leave. They weren't even going to allow us to live. Now, most people hearing that would think, that can't be us, we're too noble for something like that. But that is what the oldest written records on earth state to be the truth. Remember, Sumerian is the oldest known language in the world, older by far than works such as the Holy Bible and the Quran. It now appears that the Holy Bible was birthed out of the ashes of Sumer. What science has discovered is almost as interesting. In the exact place where the Sumerian records say we mined gold, archaeologists have found gold mines. These ancient gold mines are dated back as far as 100,000 years. What is really incredible is that Homo sapiens, that's us, were mining gold in these mines. Our bones were found there. Those gold mines had been worked at least 100,000 years ago, and they have dated humans in these mines as early as 20,000 years ago. Now, what the heck were we doing mining gold 100,000 years ago? Why did we need gold? It's a soft metal, not something you could use like certain other metals. It wasn't found very often in ancient artifacts. So why were we doing this? and where was it going? Did Eve come from the gold mines? Then there's the so-called Eve theory that people have been trying to put down for a long time. Scientists took a certain component in the DNA molecule and overlapped it to show which one came first, and they figured out that the first person of humanity lived somewhere between 150 and 250,000 years ago. And that first person, whom they called Eve, happened to come from the exact valley the Sumerians claimed that we were mining gold. Since then one scientist has discarded this theory because there are many other ways to look at the DNA origins. But I still find it remarkable that this theory just happens to point at the same valley where the Sumerian records say it all started. Thoth's version of the origin of our race. Now, let's see how similar Thoth's version is. He agrees with the Melchizedek tradition that our particular race didn't start 350,000 years ago as Sitchin says, but exactly 200,207 years ago, from 1993, or 198,214 years BC. He said that the original people of our race were placed on an island located off the coast of southern Africa, called Gondwana Land. 
I don't know if this is the right shape for Gondwana land, figure 3 to 11, it's not important, but it was in that area. They were placed here primarily so that they could be contained and not leave. When they evolved enough to be useful to the Nephilim, they were transported to the mining area in Africa and to various other places where they were used to mine gold and perform other services. So this original race, our ancestors, developed and evolved the on the island of Gondwana land for about 50 to 70,000 years. You can see on this map how the various land masses could have fit together at one time, and this is what scientists now suspect is true. They call this one land mass, before it divided, Gondwana land. They got the name from the creation stories of the tribes in Western Africa. If you read the various creation stories of these tribes, they all have different ideas about how creation took place, but one thread runs through all of them exactly the same. They all say they came from the west, from an island off the western shore of Africa, and that it was called Gondwana. They all agree on that one piece of information, with the one known exception of the Zulus, who claim to have come from space. The Sumerian records actually picture humans as about one third the height of the Nephilim. The Nephilim were definitely giants compared to us. They were 10 to 16 feet tall, if you believe the records. I don't see any reason for them to lie. Thoth said that there were giants on the earth, but he didn't say who they were or anything more about them. The Bible says the same thing. Here it is in chapter 6 of Genesis, and it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that's an important statement, when men began to multiply I'll talk about that in a moment that the sons of God think about that one for a moment, it's saying the sons of God plural, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they the sons of God, took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh this indicates that the Lord is also flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. That part of the Bible has been interpreted in a lot of ways. But when you see it in the light of what the Sumerian records are saying, it takes on a completely different aspect, especially when you read the older Bibles that tell what the giants were called. They were called the Nephilim in the Christian Bible, exactly the same sounding word as the Sumerian records give. There are over 900 versions of the Bible in the world, and almost all of them talk about giants, a large percentage of them specifically calling them the Nephilim. Conceiving the human race, the Syrian role. Thoth says there were giants here on earth. That's all he said. He didn't say how they got here or where they came from. He said that when our race was created, these giants became our mother. He said that seven of them came together, dropped their bodies by consciously dying, and formed a pattern of seven interlocking spheres of consciousness, exactly like the Genesis pattern, which you'll learn about in chapter 5. This merging created a white-blue flame, which the ancients called the flower of life, and they placed this flame into the womb of the earth. The Egyptians call this womb the Halls of Menti, which is a fourth dimensional space that's located third dimensionally about a thousand miles under the surface of the earth and is connected to the Great Pyramid through a fourth dimensional passageway. One of the primary uses of the Halls of Menti is for the creation of new races or species. Inside it is a room, based on Fibonacci proportions, made from what appears to be stone. In the middle of the room sits a cube, and on top of the cube is the flame the Nephilim created. This flame, which is four or five feet tall and about three feet in diameter, has a whitish blue light. This light is pure prana, pure consciousness, which is the planetary oven created for us to begin this new evolutionary path that we call human. Thoth says that if there's a mother, there's got to be a father somewhere. And the nature of the father, the father's sperm, must come from outside the system or body. 
So when the Nephilim were setting up their flasks and preparing for this new race to develop, another race of beings from a far distant star, from the third planet out from Sirius B, were preparing to travel to Earth. There were 32 members of this race, 16 males and 16 females, who were married into a single family. They were also giants of the same height as the Nephilim. Though the Nephilim were primarily third dimensional beings, the Syrians were primarily fourth dimensional. Thirty two people marrying each other probably sounds strange, too. On Earth, one male and one female marry because we're reflecting the light of our sun. Our sun is a hydrogen sun, which has one proton and one electron. We duplicate that process of hydrogen, and that's why we marry the way we do, one on one. If you were to visit planets that have helium suns, which have two protons, two electrons and two neutrons, then you would find two males and two females joining together to make children. When you go to an old sun like Sirius B, which is a white dwarf and highly evolved, it has a system of 32, germanium. So the Syrians came here and knew exactly what to do. They entered directly into the womb of the halls of Menti right into the pyramid and before the flame. These beings had the understanding that all things are light. They understood the connection between thought and feeling. So they simply created 32 rose quartz slabs that were about 30 inches high, 3 or 4 feet wide and roughly 18 to 20 feet long. They created them out of nothing, absolutely nothing at all, around the flame. Then they lay down on these slabs, alternating male and female, facing upward with their heads toward the center around this flame. The Syrians conceived, or merged with the flame or ovum of the Nephilim. On the third dimensional level, the Nephilim scientists placed the laboratory created human eggs in the wombs of seven Nephilim women, from which the first human being was eventually born. Conception in human terms happens in less than 24 hours, the basic process through the first eight cells but conception on a planetary level is very different. According to Thoth, they lay there without moving for approximately 2000 years, conceiving with the earth this new race. Finally, after 2000 years, the first human beings were born in Gondwana land, off the western shores of southern Africa. Enlil's arrival. Now, the part of the story where the Syrians are the father doesn't seem to completely correlate with what the Sumerian records say, at least according to the story given by Zechariah Sitchin, until you look at a sequence of events that Sitchin didn't seem to understand. Enlil, who was the first one to come to earth and was the boss in southern Africa, did not land on land when he arrived on earth. He landed in the waters. Why did he go into the waters? because that's where the dolphins and the whales were. The dolphins and whales were the highest level of consciousness on this planet, and still are. In simple galactic terms, Enlil had to go into the ocean to get permission to live and mine gold on earth. Why? Because this planet belonged to the dolphins and whales, and it is galactic law that permission must be granted before an off-planet race can enter into a different consciousness system. According to the Sumerian records, Enlil stayed with them a very long time, and when he finally decided to come onto land, he was half human and half fish. At one point Enlil became all human. This was described in the Sumerian records. You see, the third planet out from Sirius B that some call Ossiana happens to be the home planet of the dolphins and whales. Peter Shinstone, leader of the dolphin movement in Australia has channeled an unusual book, The Legend of the Golden Dolphin, which came from the dolphins and describes exactly how they came from another galaxy, how they came to be on the little star around Sirius B, and how they traveled to Earth. The entire planet there is almost completely water, there's an island about the size of Australia and another about the size of California, and that's all. On those two land masses there are human type beings, but not very many. The rest of the planet, which is all water, is cetacean. There's a direct connection between the human type beings and the cetaceans, so when Enl, an Ephilim, came here, he first connected with the dolphins, Syrians, 
to receive their blessing. Then he went on to the land and began the process that led to the creation of our race. Nephilim mothers. To recapitulate and clarify, after the rebellion, when it was decided to create a new race here on earth, it was the Nephilim who became the mother aspect. The Sumerian record says seven females stepped forward. Then the Nephilim took clay from the earth, blood from the primate and sperm from the young Nephilim male, mixed this together and put it into the wombs of the young female Nephilim who were chosen for this. They gave birth to human babies. So seven of us were birthed at once, not just one Adam and Eve, according to the original stories, and we were sterile. We could not reproduce. The Nephilim continued procreating little humans, making an army of little beings as putting them on the island of Gondwana land. If you want to believe this story, which is part Sumerian record and part Thoth, our race's mother is Nephilim and our father is Syrian. Now, if it were not for the Sumerian records concerning the Nephilim, this would all seem absolutely outrageous, and it still does. But there's a tremendous amount of scientific evidence that this is true if you read the archaeological records, not about the Syrian father, but definitely about the Nephilim mother. Science doesn't understand how we got here. You are aware that there's a missing link between the last primate and us. We seem to come out of nowhere. They do know that we are somewhere between 150 and 250,000 years old, but they have no idea where we came from or how we developed. We just stepped through some mystical doorway and arrived. Adam and Eve Another interesting part of the Sumerian records was that after they mined gold for a while in Africa, the cities in the north, near modern-day Iraq, became quite elaborate and extremely beautiful. They were in rainforests and had huge gardens around them. It was finally decided, according to the Sumerian records, to bring some of the slaves from the southern mines to the cities to have them work the gardens. Evidently we made great slaves. One day Enlil's younger brother, Enkai, whose name means snake, went to Eve, and the records used that name, Eve, and told her that the reason his brother didn't want the humans to eat of that tree in the center of the garden was because it would make them like the Nephilim. Enkai was trying to get even with his brother for a dispute they were having. The whole story is much more involved than this, but you can read it in the records. So Enkai convinced Eve to eat of the apple tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, according to the records, included more than just a dualistic point of view. It gave her the power to procreate, to give birth. So Eve found Adam and they ate of this tree and had children, each of which was listed by name on the Sumerian tablets. Now, think about the Adam and Eve story from here on, both stories the one in Sumerian records and the one in the Bible. God walks through the garden, he's walking, he's in a body, in flesh, which was suggested in Genesis. He's walking through the garden calling for Adam and Eve. He doesn't know where they are. He's God, but he doesn't know where Adam and Eve are. He calls for them and they come. He doesn't know that they ate of the tree until he sees them trying to hide themselves because they're ashamed then he realizes what they've done. Here's another thing, the word for God, Elohim, in the original Bible, intact, in all the Bibles, was not singular but plural. Was the God who created humanity a race of beings? When Enlil found out that Adam and Eve had done this, he was furious. He especially didn't want them to eat of the other tree, the tree of life because then not only would they be able to procreate, but they would become immortal. We don't know if these are really trees or not. It might have been symbolic for something bound to consciousness. Therefore, at that point Enlil removed Adam and Eve from his garden. He put them somewhere else and monitored them. He had to have monitored them because he wrote down the names of all the sons and daughters, he knew everything that was going on in the whole family. It was all written down over two thousand years before the Bible was ever written. From the time of Adam and Eve, our race developed in two strains, one that could procreate and were free, though monitored, 
and the other that could not have children and were slaves. According to modern scientists, this latter strain continued to mine gold until at least 20,000 years ago. The bones of this second strain that were found in the mines were identical to ours, the only difference is that they couldn't have children. This strain was completely destroyed at the time of the Great Flood, roughly 12,500 years ago. There is much more to this subject, which we will give to you at the right moment. We will be talking about four earth pole shifts in this work, when Gondwinalan sank, when Lemuria sank, when Atlantis sank, which is the great flood, and the one that is now about to happen. This side note is important to understand, according to Thoth, the degree of tilt of the earth's axis and the degree of the pole shift, which happens on a pretty regular basis, according to science, have a direct relationship to the change in consciousness on the planet. For example, the last time the pole shifted at the time of the Great Flood, the North Pole was in Hawaii, I realize this is debatable, at least that's where the magnetic pole was, and now it's practically 90 degrees from there. That's a big change. It was not a positive change, but a negative one, we went down in consciousness, not up. The Rising of Lemuria. According to Thoth, after Adam and Eve there was a major shift of the axis, which submerged Gondwana land. Thoth says that when Gondwana land went down, another landmass came up in the Pacific Ocean, which we call Lemuria, and the descendants of Adam and Eve were taken from their homeland and brought to Lemuria. Figure 3 to 12 is not exactly what Lemuria looked like, but it's close in a certain way. It extended from the Hawaiian Islands all the way down to Easter Island. It was not a solid mass, but a series of thousands of islands that were closely linked. Some of them were big, some of them little, and there were a whole lot more than this picture shows. It was like a continent that was barely above water, a water continent. Adam's race was brought there and allowed to develop on its own without the Nephilim interfering, as far as I know. We remained on Lemuria for 65 to 70,000 years. While we were on Lemuria, we were very happy. We had few problems. We were accelerating through our evolutionary path and moving very well. We did lots of experiments on ourselves and implemented many physical changes to our bodies. We were changing our skeletal structure, working on the base of our spine a great deal, working on our skull size and shape. We were mostly right-brained, feminine in nature. An evolutionary cycle has to choose whether it's going to be male or female, just like you did when you came to Earth. You've got to make that decision. So our race was becoming female. By the time Lamaria sank, as a race we were equivalent to about a 12-year-old girl. Explorations of Lamaria in 1910 the fact that Lemuria probably existed was established in our society as far back as 1910. We don't remember much about this knowledge, because in 1912 something happened to change our course of evolution. In 1912 experiments took place that were similar to the Philadelphia experiment of 1942 and 43, which we'll talk about later. They actually did the experiment in 1913, but it turned out to be a huge catastrophe and I personally believe that this experiment is what caused World War I in 1914. After that we were never the same. Before World War I the spiritual growth pattern of the United States was similar to what's happening right now. People were extremely interested in spiritual and psychic work, in meditation, in understanding the ancient past and in everything else of that nature. People like Colonel James Churchwood and Augustus Leplongin from France were studying Atlantis and Lemuria, and there were many similar thought patterns compared to the present. Then when World War I came along, we fell asleep and didn't start waking up again until the 1960s. But the proof they had in 1910 about the existence of Lemuria was pretty remarkable, and it had to do with coral. Coral can grow underneath the surface of water only to a depth of 150 feet. In 1910 I suspect the Pacific floor was higher than it is now, because they were able to see coral rings on the surface of the ocean floor heading away from Easter Island for a great distance. By the way, the ocean floor does rise and fall. 
You might not know it, but the Atlantic Ocean floor rose over two miles in December 1969. You can look this up in the January 1970 issue of Life magazine. In the Bermudan area many islands suddenly began to break the surface. Some are still there, but most of them sank again. The ocean floor had been over two miles deep prior to that time. At the time that Plato described Atlantis and the Atlantic Ocean, the Greeks were having a difficult time navigating their ships into the Atlantic Ocean outside the Straits of Gibraltar because the water in that area was only 10 or 15 feet deep, sometimes even less. Now the water is deep again. The coral rings they discovered in the Pacific were estimated at 1,800 feet deep. This meant that the rings originally had islands inside, because the coral had to be close to the surface in order to grow. If the rings were 1,800 feet deep, it meant that since coral cannot grow below 150 feet, the rings sank very, very slowly. In 1910 people could see these rings going off into the distance so they knew there had to be a lot of islands there at one time. Probably more important, if you follow the fauna and flora from the Hawaiian Islands, you find the same features on a whole series of islands moving along an arc from Hawaii all the way to Easter Island. These islands are separated by long distances, but if you look on a map, you'll see a long string. That string used to run along the western shores of La Maria. All those islands, including Tahiti and Borea, were part of La Maria. All the islands in this string have exactly the same fauna and flora, not on any of the other islands, just this one string, the same trees, same birds, same bees, same bugs, same bacteria, same everything. Science can explain this phenomenon only if there were at one time much closer land bridges between these islands. Ianthea and the beginning of Tantra. This new civilization in Lemuria was developing quite well, everything was going along just great. But most of Lemuria eventually sank. About a thousand years before it sank, two people were there whose names were Ianthea. This couple did something that no one else had ever done before, at least in our evolutionary cycle. They discovered that if you make love in a certain way and breathe in a certain way, you get different results when you have a child. Through the conception of that different kind of birth, all three of them, the mother, the father and the child, would become immortal. In other words, by having a baby in a certain way, the experience changes you forever. Ianthea suspected that they had become immortal, I'm sure, because of their experience. As time went on and everybody else started dying but they remained alive, people began to realize that they really did have something. So they finally set up a school. As far as I know, it was the first mystery school on the earth in this cycle. It was called the Nakal, or Narkal, rhymes with Makal, mystery school, where they simply tried to teach how to do this thing we call resurrection or ascension through Tantra. Tantra is a Hindu word for yoga or union with God though sexual practices. We have a lot to go over before we can understand exactly what they were doing. Anyway, they did this and then they began to teach other people. Before Lamaria sank, they had instructed approximately a thousand people, which means that about 333 families of three each were able to understand what they were doing and demonstrate it. They were able to make love in this unusual way. They didn't touch each other, actually. In fact, they didn't even need to be in the same room. It was interdimensional lovemaking. They taught others how to do it, and it was getting to a place where in another few thousand years they would probably have translated the whole race into a new consciousness. But God evidently said no, it was not the right time. They had just gotten started when La Maria sank. La Maria, like I said, was female and the Lemurians were very psychic. They knew that Lemuria was going to sink a long time beforehand. They knew, with absolute certainty, it wasn't even a matter of discussion. So they prepared a long time in advance. They took all their artifacts to Lake Titicaca, Mount Shasta and other places. Even the great golden disk of Lemuria was removed. 
they got everything of value out of the country and prepared for the end. When Lamaria finally sank, they were totally off the islands. They had resettled from Lake Titicaca through Central America and Mexico to as far north as Mount Shasta. Lamaria sinks and Atlantis rises. According to what Thoth says, the sinking of Lemuria and the rising of Atlantis occurred at the same time, during another shift of the axis. Lemuria went down, and what would be called Atlantis rose. Atlantis was a pretty large continent, as shown here, figure 3 to 13. The southeastern part of the United States wasn't there, Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina and parts of Texas were underwater. I don't know if Atlantis was quite this big or not, but it was pretty big. It actually consisted of this continent plus nine islands, one to the north, one to the east, one to the south and six to the west, which extended to where the Florida Keys are now. 